Hello, YouTube. It's Candace again. I am back. I'm here for some Bible study time. And I'm, I'm not going to make it too long because I still got a lot of work to do in the apartment today. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews today. Let me get that hair off. Ooh. I got to vacuum inside this room and clean up because I'm trying to get ready for inspection before I leave for my mini vacation. I'm supposed to be going um, with my sister for a few days with the kids to, a, uh, you know, to a state. I can't say where because I'm always, I'm always trying to keep things, you know, uh, private here on online, especially on social media. You know, I don't really like people knowing where I'm visiting or where I'm going and stuff like that. So. <laughs> but you'll you'll probably see me take some videos or so if I if I do a live stream around that time you'll probably see I'm out not at work of course but it's going to be a mini vacation because I'm short staffed at work and so I can't really take that much time off but I I definitely need that little time to myself but um yeah I got so much to do today so I'm gonna make this very quick this Bible study I'm hoping to make this at least a I'm hoping 30 minutes to a half and that to maybe to 45 minutes the most. I'm hoping because I got to get around to cleaning this house, vacuuming, dusting. I did the vents yesterday. I did the tub and the, the kitchen, the stove. It just all took long. You know, I had to do a lot of extra cleaning for this inspection coming up in two weeks. <sighs> so I just want it done now. Get it done and over with. <laughs> So let me get a sip of my coffee. You know, I definitely prayed this morning and, you know, asking God to guide me in this study here that I do and the things that I share here online, because the things that I share is, is the word of God. And, you know, we have to be very careful when it comes to sharing, you know, God's scriptures and his words, because there's so much that has been taken out of context, you know, in the Bible. A lot of churches, a lot of people take things in the Bible and take it out of context. And they're not reading from the Holy Spirit. They're reading from the flesh and from what they want to believe the scriptures say. So we have to be very careful with that. Hi, Roland. How you doing, Roland? <laughs> Keep rolling, 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 rolling. Keep rolling, 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 rolling. Keep rolling, rolling. <laughs> yesterday i'm still not finished i'm gonna try to make this 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 stream quick like lisa hopefully a half an hour to no more than 45 minutes y you got your coffee rolling <laughs> oh boy i'm not ready so you know i'd ask god always to to guide me in the scriptures and um today we're going to be doing um, a study on willful sin. What is a willful sinner? Biblically, biblically, and from what God teaches us, what a willful sinner is. I know we're all in that coffee time. And so um, before I get to reading, we're going to do chapter 9 and 10. <laughs> Me, I'm, I'm like working on mine. See, I'm like sipping and sipping. <laughs> mm. um, um, a willful sinner now you know you have a lot of churches and people that get this scripture so out of context and um you know you got a lot of people that say oh well a willful sinner if you do something bad mm -hmm, you're going to hell you're going to lose your salvation some people um, state, oh, faith without works is dead and all this stuff. And they don't know what they're talking about. Oh, you, if you have faith, you need to get baptized. You need to do this and that. You're a willful sinner because you chose not to do this. You know, whatever it is, people try to find different things. And it's not that complicated. You know, see, the thing with the devil is, is that he tries to find ways to complicate things. You know why? Because you want to cause confusion. And confusion leads to distrust, doubts. And make you feel like I got to work my way so hard to get into heaven, to have salvation. So that way you can sit back and say, you'll never trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to make you so confused and tied up. You don't know who to turn to. But the person you should be turning to is, so, is the Lord Jesus Christ, God. 
and his Holy Spirit's going to teach you. He says, I will put my laws into your hearts and your minds. So, he, you, you know, he's going to teach you anyways. When you trust on him and, and ask for patience, we have to all be patient when it comes to understanding the word of God. Because there's, there's going to be a lot we're going to not understand. But what we do understand is that Jesus is Lord, that he died for the sins of man. And that he's the one that can, only one that could take away our sins. So obviously we know that a willful sinner is not somebody who just sat back and made a bad choice the next day and said, well, you know, I chose to, to get drunk the next day. I, I guess I'm going to hell now. That's not, that's so unbiblical. It's not true. I'm not saying go out there and do whatever you want because, you know, being a child of God doesn't mean you have a license to sin because behind sin, there are consequences behind sin. Not just that, you're going to feel very convicted the next day. You know, like there are times I've gotten, I'm not going to lie, I've gotten drunk and the next day I wake up and I feel this sense of guilt. You know, God has a way of convicting your soul. But does that mean that I'm going to be perfect and I'm not going to make mistakes? Absolutely not. I'd be a liar if I told somebody something different. You know, so um, be, being a willful sinner is not somebody who just decided I'm going to make a bad choice today or I made a bad mistake and then they're going to lose their salvation. If, if that was the case, David and Solomon, the things they were doing in the Old Testament, they would have been and lost their salvation. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't have been. God would say, that's it. You're not coming into heaven. That, but that's the whole point. It, is Willful sin has nothing to do with that. They'll say, well, if you sin without, if you, uh, 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 if you willfully sin, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no more sacrifice. You're not going to be saved. That is not what it's saying. So we're going to read. Now we're going to read from the Holy Spirit. You know, and I, I definitely prayed on this before I came on to here. And <clears throat> um, it says here, uh, chapter 9, Hebrews. Then verily the first covenant had also ordin ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Now, this is all the Old Testament that I'm reading They're, You know, they're going into something that they used to do before the law was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus, he, he, he stopped death. You know, he defeated death with, and, and crushed it when he died on the cross. Um, in the Old Testament, Jesus didn't die for the sins of man yet, but they believed on the one that was coming. Everything that was being done was a foreshadow of what was to come. Everything they were doing was showing that they were under the law. And under the law, you're under the curse. You're under bondage, the bondage of sin, death. But Jesus, under his law, you're under the law of liberty and grace. And those who believe on him shall never perish, but have everlasting life. But this is what they used to do as a, as, as at the time before his death, symbolizing his coming, foreshadowing the great coming of the Messiah and how they couldn't fulfill the law, but Jesus was because Jesus had no sin. So this is, this is everything. If you read the old Testament, you'll see it in there. And it says, and over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signified that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which we were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. 
which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and uh, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Again, I'm going to read that. Neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own <coughs> blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He freed us from the law of bondage of sin. In the Old Testament, it used to sacrifice, do the animal sacrifices. And everybody's like, what is this all about? I don't get this. This is like some religious service. Or what, what, like, what is this to save us? It was, it, it was showing us that none of that could take away our sins. And it was a foreshadow of what's to come. Who was pure in the spotless lamb? Jesus Christ. That's what they mean. The Bible is very metaphoric. And there's a lot that people take out of context or do not understand. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to guide us, you know, and we're, and we're always still learning something new in there. So it says, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh. Forgive my husband. He's back there screaming at the video games. You may hear him say a couple F words. <laughs> How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of cows and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, not to appear in the presence of God, now to appear in the presence of God for us. I'm going to read that again, line 24. Um, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for who? For us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him 
shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven, taken. Jesus became sin for us. That's what the Bible says. He took the place of our sins and took all of that upon himself on the cross for us because of his love for us. And when we believe, the Lord will see his son, not us. If he sees us, he will see our sins. But because his son is in our place, he will see his son and our sins are washed and forgiven once and for all. There is no more, let me go and do some sacrifices to be saved. Uh, let me try to find other ways to be saved. Other sacrifices. There is no other sacrifices. There's only one that is going to be perfect and cleans you. And that's the blood of Christ. So if you think that me doing some extra things on top of my salvation is saving me, that is not true. And you have to question yourself. Are you trusting in the Lord or yourself? That is it. Um, chapter 10, this is where we get to the big one here about what is willful sin. And it, it'll all add up here. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers, worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. He means taking away the first covenant to establish the second. The second one is Jesus Christ and his blood. His sacrifice is pure. It's pleasing in the eyes of God. Our sacrifices are not because we are sinful beings. Every time we do a sacrifice, we're always sinning. The things we do is unrighteous. Our works are unrighteous. But there's one who came into the flesh to die for the sins of man, to do his will, and that's to die for the sins of man. He was sent to die for our sins, so whosoever believeth on, on him shall never perish but have everlasting life. That is God's love and grace and mercy towards us, something we don't deserve. And so, and every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he have perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, 
where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Why? Because why there's no more offering for sin, because why do you have to offer for sin if you've been saved? Jesus died and did it once and for all. He died for the sins of man. Where there's remission of sins, there is no more offering for sins. There's no more. You don't have to. You trust and believe in the one that he sent. So it's he says that he got rid of those sins forever. And he comes to live in your heart. He changes your heart. And he guides you with the Holy Spirit. And if there's anything that you've overcome, any temptations or sins that you've overcome in your life that had a stronghold on you, that is all the Holy Spirit, this God, who's working through you. And it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he have consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. See the, see the metaphor in this? Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And they're already saying, go in water and swim and, and clean yourself with water. No, what it's saying is Jesus is, he is the, he is the, the water. He is the sacrifice. He is the one that baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. He is that water. He is the bread of life. And this is all metaphoric. And so he is the one that washes us. When we do what? Have full assurance of faith. In Jesus Christ. I keep getting these stupid ads on the bottom of my screen. Get off of there. <laughs> it says again, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. When it's saying without wavering, saying just in general, to profess our faith without wavering. And I'm going to get to why he says this, and I'm going to go to the next line. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Remember, there were people that got together that was part of the fold. And some of them left the faith. They're not necessarily saying, oh, you left the church building. That's it, you're going to hell. That's not what it's saying. Because the body of Christ is those who believe. We're talking about faith. So some of them just truly, just never truly believed on Christ. They left the faith. And there was two people that were stating that started, that left and went their own ways. And they were making up some false gospel. Um, I think I forgot their names. I think one of their names was Hymenus and I forgot the other one. But there was a whole bunch of them that were leaving the faith, making their own doctrines. And it says anybody who makes any other doctrine other than what says here, you to, to, to have no association with it because he is of the devil and it's misleading and that's why you got all these different religions and churches telling you different stuff seven day adventists uh, jehovah's witness catholicism all this stuff is leading you to trust in your works the works of the law and the works of your hands the, the building the church the pastor the priest no you have to trust in lord jesus christ and that's just it there's only one mediator never said mary the pastor the priest has said jesus christ that's the only way to god so all these people are leaving and forsaking the assembling of themselves as, as the body of Christ. When they walk away from that faith, they're walking away from the body of Christ when they don't believe. And then, uh, then a lot of them, they, they went and did their own doctrine and they sat back and, and perverted the gospel. And that's how all these things came about. And, you know, that's the devil's plan. The devil is out to deceive many people. To sit here and lead you astray to doctrines that are not even biblical. Tell you, go do some rosemaries, go bend down to the fucking priest. Are you kidding me? 
I'm sorry for cursing, but it's upsetting because the devil is deceiving people. He's like, go, go, go do some holy mirrors. Go in that church building. That's where you're going to be saved. There you go to Baptist or whatever. Go to the Baptist church. Go to the Pentecostal church. No, don't go anywhere. Go believe on Jesus Christ. Go get baptized in water. That's how you're going to be saved. No, believe on Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going and having a ceremony for Christ. That's a beautiful thing. I, you know, that's a great thing to do. You know, go into water and have a ceremony. Just like when you get married, you have a wedding ring. I could take this wedding ring off right now. I could have got married without the wedding ring on. I'm going to take it off. Guess what? I'm faithful to my husband. I love him. So no matter what, whether I had the ring on or not, I'm still married in the eyes of God. I'm still his. I still am one flesh with this man in the living room. It drives me crazy every day. <laughs> I drive him crazy too. So don't think that uh, I'm this innocent here. We both drive each other nuts. But I'm still married to my husband. Whether I had put that ring on or not, the moment I sat back and took a vow with him and slept with him, I'm one flesh with him under God. And see, Jesus, when you believe on the one, when you believe on him, you're saved. That's it, period. In discussion, the Bible says, if you believe with all your heart, confess that Jesus is Lord, thou shall be saved. Believe means to believe. Then say works. If you do a baptism with water, I mean, you go and symbolize, that's a great thing. But I hope you don't think that water's saving you because you put faith into an object and, and to something else, not, not Christ. So, um, the, but this is what we we're having. This is the problems we're having in the world. The problem is the sin and the devil is sitting around deceiving many people, many, and many are going to fall because of lack of faith, because they're putting their faith and trust into something else, not Christ. They may use Christ's name in vain, which I'll do a stream about that using God's name in vain because people use his name for all sorts of things. And it's not for the right reasons at all. But they're trusting in something else. Their heart is far from him. Like Jesus said, he says, you guys profess me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. He says, you don't believe on me because because you don't you don't follow me because you believe on me. You follow me because I fed you. So not everybody that follows somebody doesn't mean doesn't mean their heart is right. I can sit back and tell somebody I love you, but my actions could show differently that I'm I'm just loving what you're giving me. You know, somebody could tell you one thing, but their heart is far from you. They could be dating you for all the wrong reasons. Same thing with Christ. Many people followed him, but for all the wrong reasons. Not to believe on him. Not because they trusted on him as their Lord and Savior and God. They looked at him as some regular man that can give them a miracle and what they want. And it said, an adulterous and wicked generation, right? An adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And the only sign they're going to get is the sign of Jonah. And so that's, and that's what that's what we see in this world today. Everybody's putting their faith and trust to all these other things and to their works and their hearts are not right with God. They're not believing on him. They're believing what they can either get for him, what they can use him for or something else, using him for profit. And that's it. And, and, and making their own doctrine. They want to look like somebody big on the pedestal, like there's some holier than thou type of Christian, a, a, a false Christian. A, a, a person that's just trying to be religious and use this this religious Christian name and sitting there trying to look holy in the thou and judging everybody, hitting them on the head and telling them they got to do, do, go to the, the priest or do this and that, slapping Bibles on their head, <laughs> doing all this stuff. And that's not believing on Jesus. That's doing tradition. That's not putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of people that are being misled in these churches and the synagogues of Satan. Okay, in the churches of Satan, and you see it all over. Okay, I'm and I'm I'm gonna say this, and I don't I don't care if a person gets offended or not. But now you got the what is the LGBTQ churches and everything. And it's not about Jesus. This is about their pride, and that's and it's the same thing there. So you got all sorts of different kinds of false prophets, false churches, not even following Jesus. They're just using him for their own justification. And this is the sickness that the devil has done to us 
or he'll make you go in a church where they're, they're looping you around where you feel like there's no hope for you and you never feel like you'll ever be saved. Because that's the devil's plot and game. And that's what that's what's going on here. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fairy indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now I'm going to get down to here. It's going to get very close to what willful sin is. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment you suppose, he shall be thought worthy. Who have trodden under foot the son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that have said vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So right there, let's stop before I go and finish up. And then I'll read one more passage. Willful sin. When somebody undertrodens what Jesus done for us, what are they choosing to be in? They choose to be in what? In belief? No, they choose to be in unbelief. They choose to undertry it with their foot what Jesus done for them. They're going back to the animal sacrifices, the religious ceremonies to be saved, trusting in who? Themselves, not Jesus Christ. So when you decide, I'm not going to put my trust and faith in Jesus, you choose to be a willful sinner. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You choose to be in willful sin. You choose to willfully be in your sins. Just like when he told the the um those Pharisees, he says, Are we blind too? And he says, If you were blind, then you, you you know what I mean. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But you say you see. So then your sins remain. Because although they see the truth, they choose to reject it and not believe. They were self-righteous. They chose to believe in themselves. And we're in unbelief and unfaithful. And they didn't believe on the one that he sent to do the will of God. The will is to believe on the son. That is the truth. And when you choose to not believe on Jesus, you choose to be in your sins. Your sins will remain. You are a willful sinner. Now, some people have their beliefs that well, maybe he's talking about the believers who um, walked away from the faith and they're going to have severe chastisement. I've heard this before. I can't argue with them. What I do know is that a true believer doesn't lose salvation. They are children of God. It says nobody can take you out of my hands. I personally don't believe a true believer will undertrod in Jesus Christ and call it an unholy thing. Now, can it ignorantly um, go into certain traditions and because they want to be a people pleaser, they may do certain things that these uh, religious traditions do, maybe, possibly. I mean, for a good example, Peter, when he was um, with the Jewish people and, and, and discriminated the Gentiles and stuff, Paul had to go and call him out on it. And of course, Peter and them stopped talking for a while, okay, in the Bible. But Peter was a child of God. He was going to be, he's, he's to be in the saved and the elect. So same thing here. I don't know if this is pertaining to children of God and that they're going to have severe punishment. Me personally, I don't think so. I think that this pertains to people who never truly seeked Jesus, that truly just never really had a heart for Christ. They just walked away and called it an unholy thing and just said, well, I, I'm going to make my own doctrine. 
I just, you know, because a child of God, we just know they're not going to go in, in a state of unbelief. They're, they're sanctified. They know the truth. That's it. Plain and simple. A true believer. Now, is there possible he could be talking about some, some believers here that are engaging in things? It shouldn't be very possible. And that they're going to have strict punishment? Very possible. But that is a willful sinner. A willful sinner chooses to undertrod in Jesus Christ and not believe on him after receiving the knowledge of the truth. After receiving the knowledge of the truth, they choose to be in their sins by rejecting Jesus Christ. When you reject Jesus Christ after receiving the knowledge of truth, you are a willful sinner. You choose to be in your sins and your sins will remain guaranteed. So I'm going to read the rest of this. Um, and I want to read one passage here in Hebrews about the sin of unbelief. And that will uh, wrap it up there. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. And partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that, af that shall, after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Again, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, here we go. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition and to perdition and condemnation, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So when you choose to go against Christ and not believe you're, and, and you just walk, but you're going back into perdition. It's a condemnation. You choose to walk that way. But they're not the ones, true believers, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We're not of that fold. We're of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. So it's showing you they're not of that fold. They are of the true believers. So we'll stop there. I'm going to just read something here real quick about the sin of unbelief again that goes right along with this in the book of Hebrews. And um, it says here, um, chapter 3, when he was talking about the uh, Moses and his time in Israel. Oh, uh, chapter three, ch um, line eight. Harden not your hearts as in the pro provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brothers, unless there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Again, I'm going to read that. Take heed, brothers, unless there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Did it say works? Be bad behavior? No, it said of unbelief. Of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, unless any of you be hardened through this deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some 
when they had heard did provoke how beat not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved for uh, 40 years? Now, this is a question they're asking you. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not the, with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom he swore that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. I'm going to read that again before I go. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. I'm going to stop there. They couldn't enter his rest because of unbelief. And those who don't believe, and the same here, if you don't believe on Jesus Christ, you will not be entering his rest because you choose to not believe. Those people in the Old Testament, they were worshiping idols and false gods, cheating and committing adultery on God, just like we're all guilty of every day. You know, I just I thank the Lord for his mercy and pray to God for forgiveness. You know, when we're sitting there idolizing something of this world, we're cheating on God. You know, <laughs> you don't stop over there. I'm going to hit him on the head. <laughs> but I am. Um, that's. <clears throat> That's what was going on in the Old Testament. They were burning their children to the false gods of Molech and Baal and all this stuff. And they weren't choosing to believe on Christ. I mean, believe on God. They weren't choosing to believe on him. Maybe they were following God and they were complaining nonstop in the wilderness. Complaining about everything. Every little thing they're complaining to God. God did it. Did, did, did. Oh, will you send me out to the wilderness? Leave me to starve? I got to read that one day in the Old Testament. They were just hard, stiff-necked people in unbelief. All of those things he done in front of them, led them out of Egypt, out of slavery. Come on now. And yet they still chose to go against God because they didn't believe on him. And so they chose to do that. And, they, and, and because of their unbelief, they, he says, they will not enter my rest. And it's the same with Jesus Christ. If you do not choose to believe on him, with his work on the cross for you, and that he is the Lord, your God, and your Savior, that he is he, and put your faith and trust into him, you are going to fall. You will not enter the rest of God. His rest is eternal salvation. That's the place coming after this, the eternal rest. So those who don't believe on him, you're under trotting Christ right under your foot and choosing to worship and put your faith into something else. Leading you down a whole path of wickedness and sin, the wickedness and the sin of unbelief, which will lead you to damnation. That's what it will do to you. Because you're putting your faith and trust into something else. You choose not to follow Christ and you want to go your own ways. Well, I, I got news for everybody here. Your own ways is wicked, unrighteous, and your ways are, or our ways are selfish. Our ways are sinful. And if we think we can trust ourselves, we are deceiving ourselves because we have a lot of wickedness in our nature. And when we think we can lead ourselves, trust and believe we will not be leading ourselves anywhere. We'll be leading ourselves into damnation, condemnation, because that's what we were condemned already. And no amount of good works we do can save us. Because every time we turn around, we're doing something bad. We're always sinning, even when we're not aware of it. We make bad choices. We look at somebody you're upset. I'm going to punch her in the face. Every day, don't say or say, I don't do those things. Because if you say that, you're a liar. And you, will, you will be sitting here going your own way in your sinful ways. With unbelief in your heart. And you have no, you have no guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life. You're sitting there deciding to choose to, to guide yourself. And some of the people that, that some of the hardest people to get are the self-righteous. You know, they're in the church thinking they're good people, walking in with sunglasses, thinking they're somebody. Thinking they're good people. I don't, I'm glad I'm not like that sinner over there. Mm -hmm. I got baptized mm -hmm, back in 98. I know I'm saved. <laughs> I'm, yep, I'm a good person because God sees me. 
Yep, and he's sitting there going, hallelujah. Ding, 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 ding. They got pianos playing in the background. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> it's like the Bible on the head. Hallelujah. And sitting there, they got pianos playing and people's on a microphone. Every time they talk, there's a piano playing. And y'all say, ding, 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 ding. Well, y'all going to get you. You won't have what you did. The sins are going to come out of you. And you're sitting there, you know, bumping the floor and everything. <laughs> I mean, ridiculous. What a, what a circus. And he's sitting there telling you, yo, what, what the problem is you ain't tithing. You need to tithe. You want God's blessings. God don't like ugly. God don't like ugly. And he's sitting there and they got pianos playing in the background. They think they're good people. And they walk out and they're over there looking at somebody and judging them. Talking about, I don't like her. Yeah, she she does and this and this and that. Da, da, da. I did not like her, blah, 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 blah. You already committed sin right there. What, what makes you so righteous? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's exactly the world we live in, in a deceptive, evil society. While yet a lot of them claim to be children of God, their hearts are far from God. Okay, their hearts is into themselves and using God. That's it. Trusting in themselves, their works, their self-righteous ways, their church, their pastor. Heck, some of them fall in love with their pastor and want to do things. I mean, th that's that's exactly what world we live in. The devil's world, the devil's playground. Everybody sits back and says, I don't understand why the world is so bad. Why is the way it is? It's the world of sin. This is not heaven. You want to get to heaven, come to Jesus Christ and believe on him. And serve him because you should do that out of obedience. If you truly believe out of out of out of a natural effect, out of obedience, out of believing on him, you're going to serve him. You know that's just something you do now that you're saved. So, <laughs> gosh, <laughs> so <clears throat> that's that's what that's what we're we're seeing, guys. We're in deception. We see all this all around us. You know, but there was a funny thought I had the other day, and I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but about people. And um, I was I was re I was watching um these videos about people who don't believe and how angry they get when they hear the name of Jesus Christ and the demons are coming out of them. And it's like, how can you be mad and upset with of a message of hope and love and grace and mercy? You know what I mean? And they sit there and they'll get mad about hearing about Jesus Christ, that there is a punishment for sin. And that there's a, a place of eternal help, but there's hope and grace to Jesus Christ and that there's eternal salvation. There's hope. There's hope after this world. How can you get mad about that unless you just mad about the truth and you just want to live a lie? Because, you know, they don't get mad by any other thing if it's a lie. They don't get mad about the Buddhists and the freaking karmas and all and how if you do something bad, you're going to come back as a, a snake or something or something bad. And they're like, mm hmm, I know that's right, girl. Yep, because that, that bitch over there, she's going to come back as an ant with legs. She'll be crawling on legs, okay? I mean, they're going to be sitting there. They'll sit here and be so quick to put their trust and faith in anything else in this world, you know, Bele and believe it. It's like, wow, so that's your purpose, just come back here? But when I tell you about Jesus Christ, something angers you. You know why? Because Jesus, when, when the Bible exposes, you can't just no longer point fingers and hold somebody else reliable for the sins. Everybody now is going to be held accountable. Everybody now is guilty. So nobody likes that. Nobody likes to be exposed. See, Jesus is that candle and that light, that flame that sits in the dark and exposes everything that's been hidden on, in the dark, that's been in the closet. It just exposes everything around you. So then people don't want to listen to that. They want, they'd rather hear some other ideology and yet they're not offended. They want to say or find excuses not to believe God. God is mean. He sent that flood. He did this and that. First of all, it's God's right. God knows what he's doing. He's a perfect, righteous God with perfect wrath, perfect love, perfect justice. Perfect righteousness, true righteousness. But why is it okay for us as human beings to have justice? And when something, uh, uh, when, when we need to point out something about somebody and chastise somebody, it's okay for us to do it, right? It's okay for us to have our police officers, our government, military men, and all of them to say and defend us when there's bad happening. And then yet there are innocent people over there getting bombed up all the time. 
And yet we're sitting there talking about, thank you for your service, which is a great thing. We have to thank, be, have, be respectful of the military personnel. But what I'm trying to say is, is, is an example. Why is it okay for us as human beings when it comes to what we do, we want to sit here and, and, and abide by our standards and say, oh, it's okay now that justice was served. But when God is serving justice because he's a righteous God, everybody wants to be mad at him. Like we God, like we're above him. Like we, we are on his level. Who are we? God looked at us and saw evil. He saw the world was becoming worse and worse and wicked and his ways are just and righteous. So when people hear that, they don't want to hear, they want to sit here and make excuses and be like, oh, well, now all of a sudden it's, it's oh, well, he's mean. You want to find every excuse in the book. And so I want to do a stream called, are you seeking to find or are you seeking for an excuse? So I'm going to be doing that one very soon too. But God is the only one that has the right truly, that has the right to take and give life. And he doesn't sit here and do things out of wickedness. He does it out of love and out of perfect righteousness, perfect wrath and justice. Okay, so he don't take pleasure in punishing the wicked, but he does what is right. He's a righteous God and his ways are righteous and beyond our ways. And when he does something, it's because it's right. You must trust and believe that. So people say, I don't understand why the world is so wicked. It's because of sin. But Jesus provided a way out for you. This is not everything. This is not heaven. We are going to die someday. The wages of sin is death. You must believe on the one that he sent. If you want eternal salvation and never have to see sin ever again. So that's just, that's just, that's the truth. People would rather live a lie and want to walk the other way because they want to believe something else or believe something else is the truth. Their hearts are too intertwined in the things of this world and they're forgetting every day or at least not thinking about it on their minds that everything around them is vain and it's going to perish. But they want to believe something else. They want to believe that, you know, I'll come back here. Yeah, come back here for what? That's your life and purpose. Just keep coming back here. There's something greater than this. That's Jesus Christ. That's God. We can't even fathom heaven. We can't fathom perfection. We don't even know what that is. So, you know, there's a lot of people are being deceived. Their minds are closed. They're, th they're, they're too much into the things of this world and tradition. So I, um, I'll make that the last thing I say in here and, uh, Roland, I'll, I will text you when I get a chance. I'm going to, I'm going to go look at the messages. <laughs> I got to finish cleaning that living room. I, I hope I can get around the hubby over there and, uh, and hopefully I can vacuum and do the laundry and then I can have my rest of my Sunday to relax. Maybe I'll practice some music too. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm rolling. Take care, rolling. <laughs> and everybody out there, <clears throat> have a good day. Have a happy Sunday. And um, I will see you guys again soon. And if EQ is streaming tonight, I will be there because I won't be doing nothing tonight for sure. I'll be back from my mom's house most likely. So um, I will see you guys later. <laughs> Take care.